make it fall. So in pseudo laboratory conditions, I suppose, uh, this galvanic skin response technology did seem to work. It did seem to correspond with when I felt something was happening differently in the world around us. So we took it a step further, went out into the geographical world. And uh, this is the response, one of the responses we saw. This is the galvanic skin response indicator of uh, approximately a 52 minute walk across town. So this is measuring not simply my responses to psychological stimuli and internal stimuli, but also external stimuli, the world around me. Um, it started about 12.35 at lunchtime, and this is me uh, leaving at the department, and then I'm walking along the streets outside. I was really aware at this point that I was walking behind people, and I had this contraption on my fingers, and I felt as if I wanted to walk a different pace, and because I could tell they were walking down the subway that I was walking, I wanted to walk down. I didn't know whether I was going to overtake them or walk behind them. So I think this change in my GSR was down to this proximity of someone else and me walking, kind of almost like walking too close behind them. And then very interestingly, there's a, there's a big peak. And this coincides amazingly with my time spent in the subway under the road, walking underneath the road in a cold, dark, grimy, really quite smelly of um, things that these subways types smell of. And I decided to stay in there for five minutes, which coincides with this period of time, approximately. And then on leaving the subway, I fall down to a, a level which I was at just normally, just walking around outside again. There isn't a substantial peak later on in, in the walk through the town centre, but these peaks here, here, and here coincide with me going into either shops or galleries or exhibitions and spending some time in them. Okay, so we can see that the, this technology does measure some sort of scientific biophysical response, what, how our body is responding to the world out there. But perhaps without this social science interpretation of that response, perhaps we're not getting a great deal. As uh, Pagano, citing the composer Mahler, outlines, the data, that biophysical score, that register, that kinks on the graphs, has everything you need to know, except the essentials. It's only with that scientific, when that scientific knowledge is interpreted through a social science understanding that we get some sort of understanding of what, what that means for that individual. And Christian Knoll found something very similar. He said, I suddenly saw the importance of people in the social science tradition interpreting their own raw bio data for themselves. I was struck by the detailed and personal interpretations of their data. Often we would sit next to each other and look at the track. Whilst I would see a fairly random spiky trail, they saw an intimate document of their journey and recounted events which encompassed the full breadth of life, precarious traffic crossings, encounters with friends, meeting people they fancied, or the nervousness of simply walking past the house of an ex-partner. So perhaps the science is the visible bit of the, uh, the scientific data is the visible bit of the iceberg, and perhaps that social science understanding gets at those essentials, the thing beneath the surface, and we need social science to interpret that. And, but how do we begin to interpret that? And that's perhaps where we can bring social science, science and art together. This is a phren phrenological map of San Francisco, taken by Lafarge, or created by Lafarge, in Rebecca Solnit's lovely Infinite Cities book that was out this year. And in it, they're trying, to, in, in, in this map, he's almost trying to artistically represent some of the things we've just been talking about and the, bio, the raw bio data uh, that science creates, saying that this is a, a literal map of San Francisco, but it's, it's a map that kind of gets at the psychogeographical and psychological understandings of it. Christian Lold has done something similar, mapping again San Francisco. The intensities of red, the, the brightness of the red, if you like, are the intensities of the, of the raw bio data responses. And almost, we can see it almost a grid system of that and the intensities where people have most biophysical response to, to the world around them. If we kind of zoom in slightly closer, we can see that there's social science understandings on this art, artistic representation of this scientific data. Um, someone was peeing in the alley. This is where I walked up a steep hill. This is a great mural of poppies in the instinct Xerxes butterfly. So a whole range of artistic representations and social scientific representation in an artistic form of what San Francisco might look like, how a mapping of the human relationships between people and place might look like. So, 
So using galvanic skin response indicators, using this GSR technology, is one example of how science, social science and, art, and an artistic approach to the relations between people and place can usefully engage with one another. We can produce different but connected knowledges where art and science meet through approaching and translating the relations between people and place in multiple but intertwined ways. From this research, we are uh, currently conducting further research in this area to create moving and mappable bioregisters of person-place interactions, with social science interpretations of the significance of these interactions for individuals. We can therefore create materials that can create innovative maps for a variety of publics, including policymakers, for example, such as this map that Christian Knowles has produced, for seeing the bio data peaking on busy traffic intersections, and if we want to make uh, safer cities, more livable cities, cities for broader publics, we can perhaps design into them thinking about how people respond in different ways to the environments. Do we want places that have such peaks? Can we interpret those peaks as excitement, as stimulation in a positive way? Or do people interpret that as fear, as road rage, as pedestrian rage, as I was thinking of as I was going under the subway? And how can we use this data to create uh, maps and implement uh, ideas for policy makers in order to design the city in different ways. So with these materials we can therefore create innovative maps for a variety of publics, policy makers, the broader public, psychogeographical maps, scientific maps, or policy and planning maps for the planning tradition, and create more livable and safe cities for a range of public groups. Thank you.